So I'd like to take the time to uh, first thank Shelly and Dr. Stoddinger for um, helping us put this on. This is, uh, I think, our third or fourth journal club now. Um, they've been going very well, and uh, we appreciate their support in uh, them helping us put this together. Um, so I'd like to introduce Jack Thomas. Jack is a second year medical student at Campbell University. Um, he got his bachelor's degree from NC State, North Carolina State University, and he majored in human biology and minored in nutrition. Um, he enjoys outdoor activities and activities involving water. Um, he also served, serves as a junior writer for the Brain and Spine Report, um, which is a division of, under the Education and Resources Branch of a larger organization called the Brain and Spine Group. Um, he also assists in promotion and outreach for that blog. Uh, today, he's going to be speaking um, on a topic uh, of an article, Pediatric Neurosurgery and the Use of Stereotactic Laser Interstitial Thermal Therapy. Um, so without further ado, I'll let Jack go ahead and get started. Can you all see my screen? Yep, good to yes. go. Perfect. So today I'm going to be discussing an article on pediatric neurosurgery and the use of stereotactic laser interstitial thermal therapy, or LED. So the reason I chose this topic is because growing up, lasers were just the absolute favorite thing of mine, especially any superhero that could shoot lasers out of their eyes, I just fell in love with. So upon re looking for some articles, I discovered this one where they talked about the use of lasers in neurosurgery. And I just missed. So the paper we will be discussing today is by Rimmick et al. and where they talk about the emerging indications of lit in pediatric neurosurgery. I would like to point out that a lot of these cases in this paper have adult population patients. And this is due to the fact of a lot of ethical concerns they have to face when trying to do research studies on the pediatric population. But the good news is, and as you will see throughout this report, a lot of the results from the adult population has means that we can now start doing some research in the pediatric population because of these great outcomes. So how exactly does LIT work? LIT uses light ablation to create minimally invasive injury to the targeted tissue, leading to acute coagulation necrosis. With the use of real-time MRI to help lead to more precise ablation and a safer outcome for the patient. If you would like, here is an article and a link to a video that will discuss in further detail of how exactly this procedure works. But just to quickly sum it up, what you do is you make a small hole in the um, skull and you'll have this laser and cooling device and then you use this MRI to help guide your laser down to where the lesion is in the brain. And here's just a cartoon schematic of what it kind of looks like. So again, how it works is you first burn a hole, use MRI to help lead you the lesion or pathology, and then you blast it. As you can see from this image over here, this can be a very technically advanced procedure and requires a lot of training from the neurosurgeon to be able to use. So some indications for lit. Neurosurgical advances have been looking for ways to create less invasive procedures that are as cost and post-operative effective as open surgery, but with less discomfort and morbidity to the patient. In the article by Rimmick et al., they discuss these nine various pathologies. So you can also use LIT for other pathologies, such as glioblastoma or epidural metastatic spine disease. Osteoastoma is something that's still in a lot of research phase, but it just goes to show where LIT is starting to be used as an alternative therapy for a lot of different neurosurgeries. So why would we use LIT? First is because it can ablate deep seed lesions that you can't normally get to with other therapies, and it also is going to involve less damage to the normal neuronal tissue. You're also going to have a decreased complication rate, decreased hospital stay, and decreased discomfort for the patient. This can be, has many advantages, especially with patients who are afraid to come in to get a procedure done because they're afraid of the discomfort level, where if we can now have options where they have less discomfort, then hopefully this means we can get them in 
and they can actually get the treatment they need instead of just avoiding it and leading to worse outcomes later in life. So now we're going to talk about some various things you're going to see throughout this um, presentation. And the first we're going to talk about is Ingle classification. Ingle classification is four different classes, and they discuss the level of seizure freedom that the patient experiences post ablation therapy with either lit or whatever um, procedure they had. The first class, class one, is when the patient has total seizure freedom. Class two is when they are almost seizure free and they have a seizure once in a blue moon. Class three is there was improvement in the seizure freedom, but they are not completely seizure free. And class four was there was no improvement and the therapy did not work for the patient. Some terminology you're gonna see in this presentation. The first one is gelastic seizure slash epilepsy, which is a seizure with a sudden burst of energy, usually in the form of laughing. SEEG stands for stereoelectroencephalography, which is a minimally invasive approach to measuring brain waves to determine the origin of the epilepsy or seizure. Epileptic seizure slash, or excuse me, epileptic focus slash seizure focus is the area of the brain responsible for causing the epileptic or seizure. And DRE stands for drug resistant epilepsy. We will now be going into the first case, which is on hypothalamic hematoma. Hypothalamic hematomas are normal neuronal cells with an abnormal architecture, and these are often seen within the tuber synursum and other areas of the ventral hypothalamus. Hypothalamic hematomas have gained attention for the use of lit therapy, one, because of their deep-seated location, the high-risk tissue that surrounds them, their little growth potential, and their good symptom response to ablation therapy. As you can see right here, here is a hypothalamic hematoma in this patient. Previous surgical options had to consider hypothalamic hematoma's involvement of the central versus lateral hypothalamus, intraventricular extension, interpeduncular cistern extension, and stock involvement. These are things you don't have to consider with lit because you can make it as a very focused guided laser approach to the lesion. The first study was done by Youngerman et al. And this had adult and pediatric patients. The results found that 87 and 60% of those patients received seizure freedom at a one year follow-up. And this was in comparison to a uh, radio surgery in which only 37% of those patients experienced seizure freedom and 22% saw substantial reduction at a three-year follow-up. It is important to note that disconnection of the hypothalamic hematoma region is sufficient for seizure freedom in some cases versus complete ablation or resection of the lesion itself. Another study was done by Curry et al. They had 71 adult patients with a hypothalamic hematoma. More than 97% experienced seizure freedom at a one-year follow-up, and less than 25% required additional ablation. Complications that were noted for these patients who underwent lit for their hypothalamic hematoma was temporary neurological problems such as hemiparesis, speech difficulty, and vision changes. I'm going to talk about the next pathology, which is tuber sclerosis. Tuber sclerosis is an autosomal dominant disorder with tumor suppressor gene mutations on chromosome 9 and 16. You can see right here, tuber sclerosis can affect many organs in the body and can lead to seizures as one of the effects. 90% of tuber sclerosis patients experience seizures and less than a third are manageable with anti-epileptic drugs alone. Children with tuber sclerosis can have multiple or bilateral cortical tubers, which require multiple large or bilateral craniotomies, versus lit, which can be much less invasive and get more of the lesion at one time. One of the studies done was by Hale et al. And of note, there were two patients I want to discuss today. One was a 13-year-old female who underwent lit, and the other was a 7.9-year-old female who had open resection third surgery. The 13-year-old female experienced Ingle class 2 at a 1.2-year follow-up. She had no prior history of epilepsy surgery. She had lit therapy of her right frontal lesion 
and right superior insula, and she experienced no procedural or medicational complications post-ablation. The eight-year-old female, she had open resection of her right front temporal lesion and insula with a corpus clostomy. Postoperatively, she had left-sided hemiparesis for one week, and she was only ingle class three at a 3.85 year follow-up. We're now gonna discuss a cavernoma-related epilepsy. These are cavernoma-related epilepsy is normally treated with resection surgery, but LID has been growing as an alternative treatment option. Retrospective cohort studies have shown with cavernoma-related epilepsy with LID have led to longer term uh, seizure freedom rates and higher rates of discontinuing anti-seizure medications versus resection alone. Right here, you can just see what a cavernoma is, and it's a benign growth of vasculature that can be seen in the brain and spinal cord. One of the studies was done by McCracken et al., and they had five patients. All five patients had zero adverse effects of lip therapy, and four of the five patients had seizure freedom at a 12 to 28 month follow-up. The next study was done by Willie et al., and this had 17 patients total. 14 of those 17 patients had seizure freedom, and out of those 14, 10 were classified as Ingle class one at a one year follow-up. And two of the seven patients did not experience any seizure freedom, and they had to undergo additional procedures and ablation therapy. Now I'm gonna talk about corpus callosum. Your corpus callosum is a large C-shaped nerve fiber bundle located under the cerebral cortex, and it connects the two hemispheres of your brain. Initial studies have shown lit to be as effective as traditional open callosomy. One of the studies was done by Roland et al., and they wanted to investigate the effectiveness of lit in completion callosomy. Two of the patients received hey, zero... Jack can, I, Jack, can I interrupt real quick? Can people make sure that their mics are muted? Thank you. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Two of the patients had zero reoccurrence of their seizures, and the remaining four had seizure reduction. Of those four, two of them were pediatric patients, and I want to pay attention to them mainly. So before I can tell you about them, I need to discuss what fractional anastrophe is. And fractional anastrophe is a measurement to quantify the anastrophic diffusion of white matter fiber tracts, reflecting the directionality and structural organization of white matter and thus may be used in the planning or post-operation evaluation of patients with who underwent lit calistomy. These two pediatric patients had a decreased FA, which was suggesting the lit procedure was successful at disrupting the structure and organization of their colossal fiber tracts. And as you can see right here, here's an image of one of the adult patients. First two, A and B are gonna just show you where they had um, their lesion is located, and it was at the splenium and genuum of their corpus callosum. And C is going to show you where the neurosurgeon was targeting his ablation therapy. And D and E are showing you what the patient looked like post-ablation. And you can see here at the genuum and at the splenium, they had the post-ablation and decreased uh, fibers in their corpus callosum, which led to them being seizure-free. Now we're going to discuss mesiotemporal lobe epilepsy. Mesiotemporal lobe is function is associated with memory, auditory processing, language processing, and visual processing. Reynolds et al. had a study done with a cohort of 43 patients with mesiotemporal lobe epilepsy, and 34 of those patients had mesiotemporal sclerosis. They all had a one-day post-op hospital stay, and only one of those patients had a case of optic neuritis. 99.5% of the patients had Ingle class one at a six month follow-up, and this dropped to 67.4% at a 20 month follow-up. I was curious as to why it dropped, so I looked back at the original paper, and the authors noted that the patients with mesiotemporal sclerosis who did not have SEEG monitoring pre-ablation had lower Ingle class scores and in their collusion, they thought this might have something to do with it, but it would need further research. I did want to note 
that there was no statistical significance in achieving seizure freedom when comparing the subgroup of patients with mesiotemporal sclerosis that did not undergo SEEG pre-ablation and the subgroup without mesiotemporal sclerosis that did have SEEG monitoring pre-ablation. And this was to show that LIT is a viable option even with MRI negative lesion findings. The another study was done by Drain et al. And these patients had LIT on the amygdala and hippocampus. The LIT patients had better cognitive outcomes when compared to the open resection patients. Those who had temporal lobe epilepsy in their dominant hemisphere, the open resection patients had weaker performance on naming tasks post-surgery versus the LIT patients. Those with temporal lobe epilepsy in their non-dominant hemisphere, the LIT patients had better recognition task scores post-surgery versus the open resection patients. More research is still needed on LIT's influence on the cognitive outcome in children, but what we've seen in adults looks pretty promising. And over here, you're going to see a photo of where the uh, temporal lobe is, and here is just an example of a mesial temporal lobe lesion that's causing epilepsy in this patient. Now we're going to talk about SEEG. SEEG with seizure onset zone ablation. So right here is what an SEEG will look like, and you can see there's lots of little holes that the neurosurgeon will make to help map out the brainwave frequencies to determine where the seizure onset zone is. And over here is just what an EEG will look like. And as you can see, right over here is where there's some sort of pathology going. And the uh, neurosurgeons would have this mapped out so they know exactly what each line is representing so they know where the seizure is happening. This red line down here is just an EKG of the patient. So SEEG thermocoagulation has been used throughout Europe and is associated with up to 20% seizure freedom despite these small lesions that the patient had to have. So then some researchers thought, what if we use SEEG to find the seizures since MRI is showing that the patient is negative for a lesion cause and then use LIT to ablate the epileptic focus area versus SEEG thermocoagulation alone? This is, again, something that still needs a lot of research. It's just interesting to note that we're trying to create less minimally invasive procedures for the patient and ways we can have them have better outcomes. This right here was done by Sharman et al. And they had looked into SEG with LIT, and they noticed the potential, but also said much research is still needed in this field. But it is looking like it could be a safer first line approach for patients. Now we're gonna talk about the insula. The insula is complicated. The insula is believed to be involved in functions such as compassion, empathy, taste, perception, motor control, self-awareness, cognitive functioning, and interpersonal experience. Because of its location of being folded deep within the lateral sulcus, which separates the temporal lobe from the parietal lobe, in the frontal lobe, it makes it difficult for neurosurgeons to get to and ablate the seizure onset zone. So LIT has become an alternative therapy option due to its minimum evasiveness and decreased potential for damaging healthy neuronal tissue. Perry et al. did a study where they demonstrated a post-ablation seizure freedom rate that is comparable to conventional open resection or other surgical techniques. A cohort of 20 patient, pediatric patients with drug-resistant epilepsy with a total of 24 LIT procedures done, they noticed only 29% adverse effects, and those adverse events were just mild hemiparesis and mild expressive language dysfunction. This was to show that LIT is a viable treatment option for the management of drug-resistant epilepsy and a remarkable alternative to open resection given both its accuracy and minimum evasiveness. And here I just wanted to show an image of a patient with an insular epilepsy, and you can see where the neurosurgeon was guiding the lit laser to help ablate this lesion. As you can see right here, here is the insula in this patient, and this 
right side looks much different than the left side on this patient. And that's because right here, there was a lesion that the neurosurgeon went in to try to ablate for this patient. Now we're gonna talk about pediatric neuro-oncology. There's lots of emerging literature on LITS use as a treatment option for adult brain tumors, but there's been less attention for pediatric brain tumors, and this is again due to a lot of ethical concerns. So how LIT affects these various tumor pathologies and influences clinical outcomes still remains an open question. Over Spinoza and Choi study, they had 11 patients with various tumor pathologies. They noticed that the tumors decreased in size at a three-month and six-month post-ablation follow-up. Most of these patients' tumors were in areas difficult to access, such as the thalamus and midbrain. There was a decreased hospital stay of all the patients, and it was on average three days. This is again, something that's really exciting, but still needs a lot more research to be done, but it is potentially a safer treatment option for these patients. LIT may also have additional future applications in administering chemotherapeutic agents in pediatric neuro-oncology because it can break down the blood-brain barrier and allow these chemotherapeutic agents to get to the brain much easier. This is again something, as you can imagine, will have a lot of research needing to be done because that can lead to a lot of adverse effects. Here's an image from the CHOI study and where one of the patients had a tumor right here and they had their ablation therapy and at their three month and six months follow-up, you can see how it was starting to decrease in size and at their last follow-up, it was substantially decreased in comparison to their pre-op MRI. The last pathology we're going to talk about today is periventricular nodular hyperoptia. Periventricular nodular hyperoptia is when the neuronal cells fail to migrate to their actual location. Instead, they just stick by the ventricles. This is often associated with drug-resistant epilepsy and cortical malformations, which are focal cortical dysplasia and polymicrogyric. These have some promising clinical results when used with SEEG and LIT, and have become an increasingly popular alternative for treatment for these patients. That results involving children is limited, but what results we have seen in adults looks very promising. And the results we've seen in adults is four case studies. And these case studies had a total of eight pa adult patients with PNH, and they all underwent lit therapy. Three of those four reports showed 100% post-ablation seizure freedom with 0% rate of adverse events. So, this in conclusion is again a promising future. And over here is an image of, you can see these neuronal cells are all by the ventricles and they failed to migrate over to where they actually need to be. So what's next? after reviewing the study is more research. There's been a lot of great outcomes that we've seen through these other various pathologies, but these again have been a lot of adult patients. This topic was on pediatric neurosurgery. So we still have a lot more research to be done, but based on what we've seen with the adults, this is promising and hopefully means that we can do future research in the pediatric population where some ethical concerns can now be put to rest. Here are my references for the study. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Jack, great job. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, it looks like we already have one here by Mike Johnston. Jack, um, thank you very much that presentation, uh, I was pretty clueless uh, regarding some of these uh, procedures and uh, innovative technology. So I wanna say thank you for that. Uh, having said that, um, Jack, what, uh, again, showing my naivete, but what uh, thermal um, range are we talking about when you imply this form of therapy? Um, can you tell me what the temperature might be or the, um, uh, at, the, at the cell level? 
Do, do we know that? Can you govern that? Can that can be can that be controlled? I do not entirely know. Um, I was curious about that too because in the video he did talk about how the MRI is used to show where the temperature is and how we yeah. can see it increase or decrease. And in the video he said it can just vary with the patient, um, especially when comparing a pediatric to adult patient. So I'm not entirely sure because I saw some variable answers. So I didn't want to put that in because I know I don't want to say one thing and then you read something else that says com something completely different. Sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your honesty. The other, um, the other uh, question I would have is um, you've obviously done some um, homework on this. Can you tell me how many other major institutions are utilizing uh, this form of therapy? I will be honest and say no, I cannot. Um, from what I've seen is it is still an emerging uh, treatment approach because there's still a lot of not research done. Almost all the studies that I pulled my data from were all published in 2020. Okay. All so right. All pretty new. Sorry about that. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I do appreciate your uh, your interest in this, and I'm sure you're going to be teaching us uh, about this. Someday. So again, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, questions? Any else? I have a few questions, but I'd like to let others go first. All right. Looks like we're shy today. Um, so I can go ahead and ask a couple of questions, Jack. Um, I know that a lot of the studies mentioned um, the outcomes at the three month and six month and, and even further out than that follow ups. Did they mention anything about um, outcomes on imaging or otherwise initially? So right after the procedure? Surprisingly, no. I thought that was kind of interesting where I didn't see, I went to a lot of the studies that I pulled because um, this was like a case report. So they pulled a lot of studies themselves in this paper. And so I went to the original paper and a lot of them never had an actual post ablation MRI. They usually had like three month or a year follow up or something like that. Okay, cool. I was wondering, I, I would just speculate that um, since the brain tissue is extremely sensitive, that there'd be a possibility of some type of push procedure, uh, edema or swelling. Um, so I didn't know if that led to any temporary adverse outcomes. Mm -hmm. I do know that um, a lot of the studies did have them stay, the patient stay on that MRI imaging for a while post ablation just to kind of monitor that. But one thing too with the lit therapy is it was so focused with the laser projection that it made sure that it was like not hurting any other tissue. And that was another thing with, especially with the tumor oncology one where they said, even though this is great, we still don't really know how this is gonna affect the tumor's pathology in the future because it's still such a new thing they're trying. Awesome. Thanks for that, Jack. Um, looks like Keanu has a question. Yeah, hey, man, great job. Um, I had a quick uh, It's more of a clarifying question. Um, I just may have missed it because my connection was really bad. Um, could you talk about the treatment again in the in the setting of like a temporal of epilepsy or just an epilepsy in general? Yes. Um, let me make sure I get the right thing before I tell you something wrong. Ah, there we go. Um, so what exactly were you looking for again? Uh, just, just the treatment use in the setting of epilepsy. Um, I just might've missed that small section. So in the study I was looking at, they had either underwent, um, lit therapy or they had undergone, um, uh, let me get it, uh, SEG, oh, I'm sorry about that. Actually, okay, I'm sorry. Um, that study in particular I looked at, they had used uh, lit therapy, but some patients had SEEG monitoring and some did not. And it was kind of an interesting study because there was only um, 
there's only nine patients who didn't have mesiotemporal sclerosis, or the other 34 did. So it was a little interesting to see how the lit therapy affected mainly just those with mesiotemporal uh, sclerosis, but they didn't notice any difference with those who had uh, SEG monitoring pre and po uh, pre ablation and those without it. And I'm sorry if that, I hope that helps you answer your question. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you. So, Keanu, are you asking what the just the normal treatment of epilepsy is? No, no, no. I was just walking home and it was really windy, and so I was wondering. I heard epilepsy, and then I, I of course, he's talking about the treatment. So I was just wondering. Uh, if the treatment was used in a, in like temporal of epilepsy or something. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks like Gretchen has a question. Hey, good job, Jack. Um, this was super interesting and excited to see where it can go from here. Um, did you talk about, is this just kind of like a one and done procedure or is it going to take like multiple steps to get these lesions gone? <laughs> So for most patients, it can be a one and done. It just depends on the size of it, where its location is, and how the patient responded to it post ablation. Some of the patients had complete seizure freedom at their follow-up months, so they didn't really have to have anything else, but some of them had to have additional therapies. It just, again, depended on what the pathology was, where it was located, and how the patient responded to it. Um, I know, I think it was the pediatric oncology one, uh, yeah, the pediatric oncology one, those patients, um, they, some of them, there's a total of 24 procedures done with the 20 patients. So some of them didn't only needed one therapy, some needed like an extra one, but for the most part, it seems like it was a one and done. But again, it was like one of those, we don't really know how this is going to affect the long-term future of these pathologies by using the lit therapy. So they're just kind of following them and monitoring them. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, everybody. Um, looks like Vinny has a question as well. Yeah, um, I guess this is more future research that can be followed up upon. But um, you mentioned like most of the cases um, you pulled uh, regarding lit therapy were from 2020. So I was just kind of curious about, you know, tumor recurrence rate. But I guess that's something. Um, that's like foreseeable research to be done. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, one of the studies did mention that they said we don't really know exactly how lids can affect the tumor pathology in the future. So these are monitoring those patients even today. Um, so it will be interesting to see if the tumor comes back at all. If it doesn't, it just kind of depends on the person and the tumor, I guess. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Hey Jack, can you, um, you might have talked about this, um, sorry, I'm <laughs> doing something else right now, but um, can you talk a little bit more about how lit is being investigated against other standards of care, um, corpus colectomy, vagal nerve stimulation, um, responsive neurostimulation, things like that? They were amazingly comparing it with the Ingle classifications. Okay. The, a lot of that had to do with like they noticed that with lit therapy, a lot of the patients had higher uh, Ingle class scores, like one and two, versus some of the traditional um, therapy options, and also patients' comfort and discomfort levels, hospital stay, all of that in comparison from traditional surgeries to lit therapy. Gotcha. Cool. Awesome. Uh, looks like Jose has a question. Yes, good day there. Excellent presentation there, Jack. Um, the Thank you. one, the one question I have is that um, concerning about the post-operative um, management for those who have, uh, let's say, they've gone through this um, treatment and the the um, the tumor regresses again. Argument said, would you say that uh, they will go through the similar? Um, sim I'm sorry. What was your question? I'm sorry, you cut out for me. No, no, no. What I was asking was that for the post-operative care, when, if these tumors regress after going through this um, treatment approach, would you say that they may might re, re, uh, return back to the normal uh, protocol, or is it a different approach in terms of the treatment options? 
That I think would depend maybe on how the patient first reacted to lit therapy. Um, again, in that oncology study in particular, uh, they were the one that talked mostly about what if the tumor came back, and they just said it just depends on the patient. A lot of the patients did, in some of the studies, have to undergo another round of um, lit therapy, but when they went it, it could have been like a couple days post their initial one. It could have been at a couple months follow-up. I think it just depended on the patient and their outcome to the initial therapy. I see. Thank you there. Mm -hmm. um, Jack, um, I'm curious, could you um, talk to us a little bit about some of the limitations of some of these studies? A lot of the limitations had to do with, uh, as you can imagine, ethical concerns because we're using a laser and you just one slight little off center from where it's supposed to go, it can just really damage some the typical normal neuronal tissue. So that was one of the biggest concerns they had, and that's why they had to use like a lot of MRI, and it took a long time just to even start the therapy because you had to make sure that the laser beam wasn't going to go further than it had to, and it was going to hit only the tissue it was supposed to. And a lot of times they wanted to go down the long axis of the lesion to ensure that it gave itself a little bit of a wiggle room instead of trying to go like through a short access. Okay, awesome. I'm assuming that um, there's probably some ethical issues with like randomizing groups, um, especially if prior studies are showing that this might have better outcomes. Um, that'll probably continue to be a limitation, I'm assuming, especially as they, if they move this research forward in the pediatric population. Um, sample size is probably also um, an issue too. It, it seems like a lot of the studies were reporting their their um, not so not very much in a comparative manner. So that might also be um, a limitation. And one other thing I thought of is um, I don't know if they discussed or if they stratified patients by prior therapy. So if, if people have been on say one or two or five different anti-epileptics or if they've had a procedure before. Um, so I'm not sure if they discussed those things, but if not, those are things to keep in mind, um, especially when a new exciting novel therapy comes out. Um, it's, I'm not saying that this is not successful. It sounds like it's going pretty well, but it can be easy to manipulate the results to make them seem one way or another. So, so. Yeah, a lot of the papers did actually talk about if some of them had um, undergone additional therapy or how many medications they were on or whatever their case may be. I just didn't want to bore you all with all that information. So I was like, we'll just kind of take that out. But they're all in the references. So if anybody wants to see that actual paper and stuff, it's in my references. Hey, Jack. I have a quick question. Um, and I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but when they use the laser, um, is it robotic uh, like a Da Vinci is? So the new Da Vinci robot, like, um, pairs to the table. So if the, I mean, the patient should be in a Mayfield, I assume, so that they can't move. But um, if the table was to move, the robot moves with the table. So is it like paired in that sense? Do you know? I do not know. Okay. That's okay. Sorry about that. I never so thought to look into that. I... I'm just wondering from like a safety standpoint. I mean, the like the Da Vinci is safe for that reason, right? And I, Mm -hmm. just to like the limitations and I wonder if that's like a selling point in the future. Hmm. That's something I'll have to look into. I'm not curious. Um, one thing I did read about this to follow up on your question, I'm not sure about the table itself, uh, but I did see that there are safety features that if um, I'm not sure what degree of um, like accuracy or wiggle room there is, but if, if it if the laser is moving outside of the target area, it's an automatic shutoff feature. So um, I'm not sure if that's part of how they combat the combat that issue, or if it's um, something involved in the table as well. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? It uh, looks like uh, Mr. Johnson has another question. Uh, Jack, um, I'm going to have to split, but I did want to compliment you uh, not only on your depth of knowledge uh, at this level, but uh, also 
brought class to this organization by wearing that sharp looking bow tie. So thank you. You look good and uh, you had a very nice presentation. So have a blessed day. Thank you very much. Have a blessed day as well. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. All right, any more questions? All right, well, for the interest of time, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, Jack, thanks for a great presentation. It was a very novel topic. Um, I'm sure many of us were pretty naive. Um, Wait, before we go, I wanna know what Jack wants to study now. Like, what's the thing that you wanna research based off of this? I'm really curious more about the, if the tumor comes back. I think that's something that was just kind of interesting, like, or any of the lesions, like, what is the reoccurrence rate? And I'd love to see more papers come out or even look at past papers of similar therapies with lasers and see how, like, if they reoccurred and if so, what did they do different for this um, therapy version versus the other ones? So what do you think is more clinically relevant, reoccurrence rate or progression-free survival? I would maybe go with recurrence rate only because it can come, can't tumors usually come back as more aggressive? That's a good thought. So what you're really, from a clinical standpoint, you know, the patients are, they, they worry about the symptoms, right? And whether, and then obviously overall survival. Um, so what we really want to do is things like this, we really worry about um, like how long they don't have symptoms or, sim or uh, signs of progression of disease. So, <laughs> Um, what we're, you know, that'd be something to be interested in, certainly stratified by tumor. I don't know if they, you know, like tumor type, you know, medulloblastoma versus pyelocytic astrocytoma or, or whatever the type, tumor type, it'd be interesting to look at to see um, how these, how these kids and young adults are uh, progressing after they're treated with lit versus other therapies. Um, but yeah, you're totally right. That'd be, that, that would be a good next step. Um, I think you're, you're on the right track there.